Hi, my name is Michael Trower, an emergency medicine consultant from St. Thomas's Hospital in London, and this talk is about gallbladder point of care ultrasound. And we'll focus on the specific condition that I think is most relevant to emergency physicians, and that is, of course, acute cholecystitis. But let's start with a case. So a 42-year-old female presents with 24 hours of epigastric pain, some nausea, one vomit, only has a history of gastritis and takes a PPI. There are her observations, so temperature 37.6, heart rate 95, respirate 22, blood pressure and SATs are fine. On examination, her epigastrium is tender, but her abdomen is soft. Her inflammatory markers are mildly raised, amylase is normal. And her pains now come down from 7 to a 5 out of 10 after some oral analgesia. Uh, it's in the evening, after hours, so you can't get a formal ultrasound. So what would you do for this young lady? And there's no right or wrong answer here. I'd just like you to consider what you would actually do in your workplace. And I'll give you three options. So A, admit her under general surgery for an inpatient ultrasound. B, discharge her home to return for an ultrasound during normal hours. Or C, get a CT abdomen pelvis and then decide what to do with her. So there are pros and cons to each of these options. Um, just take a moment to think about what you would actually do. In terms of A, uh, admitting her under surgery, I guess, would be the safest. Uh, on the other hand, there's not really much we'd be doing for her overnight. She really needs the ultrasound to make a diagnosis of cholecystitis versus biliary colic versus peptic ulcer disease. In terms of B, discharging her home, might be reasonable if there was some kind of pathway where we could bring her back to a surgical assessment unit the next day that might be quite a good option for her on the other hand there's a risk she could deteriorate overnight and in terms of c well ct will definitely give us uh, a diagnosis but it's probably not indicated in this situation given the fairly innocuous examination findings the radiologist is probably going to be reluctant to do a ct in this situation especially given the patient's age and the issues with radiation so there are pros and cons to each, uh, but would performing a point-of-care ultrasound be another option in this situation? Well, hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll have a bit more knowledge about the technique and the evidence behind doing a gallbladder scan, and you can reconsider whether you think that might be a suitable option in this situation. Let's consider one more case to demonstrate a different context in which gallbladder ultrasound can be useful. So this time we have an 83-year-old male who presents with 24 hours of confusion. He's got a complex medical history including COPD, CCF and type 2 diabetes. He's on multiple medications including prednisolone, bisoprolol, furosemide, metformin. These are his observations. So temperature 37.7, heart rate 60 but he's on a beta blocker. Respirate is 25, his SATs reasonable for his age. On examination, his abdomen is soft. He's possibly got some tenderness in his epigastrium, but he's quite difficult to assess. He's quite agitated. And there are some scattered crackles bilaterally. His bloods show mildly raised inflammatory markers, borderline lactate, and the chest x-ray and the urine sample are both kind of unhelpful, some subtle changes in each. Okay, so what would you do for this elderly gentleman? He's got confusion or delirium. We think it could be an infection because his temperature and his inflammatory markers are a little bit raised, but we don't have a clear focus. So let me give you four options. Admit him under medics for IV antibiotics. Refer him to Gen Surge. Get a CT abdomen pelvis and then decide what to do. Or get an ultrasound and then decide what to do if it's during normal hours and you can get an ultrasound. So take a moment to consider which of these you would actually do in your workplace. And do you think point of care ultrasound could be useful for this elderly gentleman? I guess it depends a bit on your answer to that first question. If you were going to perform a CT anyway, then it would be less useful. However, if you were going to admit him under medics for IV antibiotics without a clear focus of infection, then identifying acute cholecystitis on a point of care ultrasound I would say would be very useful because it would give you a clear diagnosis and it would change the disposition of the patient. But yeah, take a moment just to consider would POCUS be useful in either of these two situations?
Okay, so hopefully I've stimulated some thought on the topic of whether a point of care ultrasound for acute cholecystitis could be useful in your workplace. Now let's go back to basics and talk about technique, how to scan the gallbladder. So first, probe selection. So you'll generally want to use the low frequency curvy linear probe on an abdo preset. You can use a micro convex probe or a phased array probe. They're a bit better for getting between the ribs, but generally the low frequency big curvy linear probe is the probe of choice for this exam. In terms of patient positioning, there are two maneuvers that can help here. Firstly, lying the patient in the left lateral position. So you can scan the patient both supine and in left lateral, but left lateral often gives the best view because the bowel falls out of the way and gives a better view of the gallbladder. And the second thing that you can do is ask the patient to take a deep breath in and then hold their breath. This will push all the abdominal contents down as the diaphragm comes down and give often a better view of the gallbladder below the costal margin. In terms of probe positioning, I would scan both intercostally and subcostally. And I would usually start intercostally. If the patient has a tender abdomen, it'll be much less painful for them if you start scanning between the ribs where the ribs protect the gallbladder. If you immediately go in and start prodding them in the tummy, this won't be a good start to the relationship. So start intercostally. Some people talk about X minus seven, so a ziffy sternum, and then seven centimeters laterally to that is generally the point where you'll find the gallbladder. So in general, you want the probe marker either to the patient's head or to the patient's right, but you can rotate the probe a little to get more parallel to the ribs so you have less rib shadowing. Then if necessary, you can move to subcostal. And here I would have the probe in the sagittal plane with the marker to the patient's head, and I would sweep down the costal margin. So have the patient take a deep breath in and then just sweep your probe down looking for the gallbladder. Once you find the gallbladder, then make subtle clockwise or anti-clockwise rotations of the probe to bring it out in long axis and then pan through, so sweep through, just like you're panning through on a fast scan in Morrison's pouch looking for free fluid. So you're trying to really uh, scan through the whole gallbladder looking for anything within the lumen. Then rotate the probe through 90 degrees and do the same thing. So fan through the whole gallbladder in long and short axis. Okay, let's review some anatomy. So here we have the gallbladder. So the fundus, the body, the neck, and then the cystic duct with the spiral valve, which joins with the hepatic duct to form the common bile duct, which then joins with the pancreatic duct to expel its contents into the duodenum at the ampulla of vata. And here is what those structures look like on ultrasound, the sonoanatomy. So we have fundus, here's the body, here's the neck, and here's the cystic duct. But the part of the gallbladder that we want to focus on is the neck. So if a gallstone is sitting in the body or the fundus, then it's not causing any problem, it's just incidental. It's when it gets impacted in the neck that it actually causes a problem. So we really need to focus our exam on the neck of the gallbladder. Don't get distracted by the body, just focus in on the neck. So a normal gallbladder is no more than eight centimeters in length, four centimeters in width, and the wall is no more than three millimeters in thickness. So these are the numbers that you need to remember for gallbladder dimensions, eight, four, and three. Here are a couple of normal variants. So in the image here on the left, we have a contracted gallbladder. So this patient has probably just had a fatty meal and the gallbladder has expelled all of its bile. And so the lumen is almost completely empty. You can just see a tiny bit of bile still in the gallbladder there in the middle. And you'll note the wall looks quite thickened here. And that's normal in a contracted gallbladder. You can even see three distinct layers of the gallbladder wall. So a bright outer an inner layer and a darker middle layer. And that's normal in a contracted gallbladder. We know there's no impacted stone because the gallbladder has been able to expel all of its bile. And the image on the right shows another normal variant. So this fold here is normal. Some people call this a Phrygian cap, but basically folds within the gallbladder are normal. Okay, gallstones. So there are three main features in terms of how gallstones look on ultrasound. So they should be hyperechoic or bright. They should display shadowing and they should be gravitationally dependent. So here we see some typical gallstones. So they're bright or hyperechoic, they have shadowing, and they're gravitationally dependent. They've fallen back 
to the bottom of the gallbladder, as opposed to something like a polyp, which could hang from the roof of the gallbladder. In terms of shadowing, some of these smaller gallstones down here in the second image don't show such obvious shadowing. So a couple of things you can do to try and improve your visualization of shadowing. One would be to move the focal zone to the level of the gallstones, and two would be turn off compound imaging. So here's an example of multiple gallstones. So there are a whole heap of gallstones here, all piled up into the neck of the gallbladder. Although you'll note the gallbladder itself actually looks quite healthy with a nice thin wall and no fluid around it. This second image shows a gallbladder that's so full of stones that you can't even really tell that it's a gallbladder at all. So the yellow arrow actually refers to the anterior wall of the gallbladder just here. The blue arrow refers to the gallstones that are piled up all the way up to the top of the gallbladder. And the green arrow refers to the shadow cast by these stones. So this phenomenon is known as wall echo shadow or WES. So when the gallbladder is so full of stones, it can be hard to even tell that it is a gallbladder, but you just look for that subtle wall and then echo and then shadow pattern. Okay, so say you see a gallstone in the neck of the gallbladder and you wonder, could this be causing the patient's pain? One useful test you can do is to assess whether that gallstone is mobile or impacted. So if it's mobile, it's probably not causing a problem. It's only when the gallstone becomes impacted or stuck in the neck that it actually causes a problem. And so by rolling the patient onto their side and then scanning them while you're rolling them onto their side, you can actually pick up the gallstone rolling back into the fundus, sometimes referred to as the rolling stone sign. So if your gallstone is mobile, it's probably just incidental. So here is some beautiful sludge. So sludge is the precursor to gallstones. So it's this sort of uh, mid-range echogenicity material that's at the bottom of the gallbladder here. So just like gallstones, it's gravitationally dependent, but unlike gallstones, it's less bright and doesn't cause a shadow. So the more gallbladders you scan, the more incidental findings you'll see. And even though we're performing a focused scan, for a binary question, does my patient have acute cholecystitis or not? Still, we should have some idea about what to do for incidental findings. So polyps are a common incidental finding. These images show in the top image a single small polyp and in the bottom image multiple small polyps, sometimes referred to as a strawberry gallbladder. So in terms of polyps, the size of the polyp is quite crucial in terms of whether it's most likely benign or malignant. So small polyps are more likely benign, once they're over about 10 millimeters, the risk of malignancy is significantly higher. So generally polyps that are less than 10 millimeters and asymptomatic just need another scan in six or 12 months. However, if you're in any doubt about an incidental finding, it's always better to err on the side of caution and always try and get all these incidental findings reviewed by a suitable expert at the earliest opportunity. Larger polyps are more worrying. So these are two examples of large masses, so more than 10 millimeters. So in these situations, the patient's likely to either need a cholecystectomy or some kind of further imaging to define what that lesion is. So if you see something like this, you know, don't ignore it. Make sure you get expert review. And remember, you could do the patient a great service by picking up something potentially malignant very early. You could even save their life. Another common incidental finding is adenomyomatosis. So this is a benign condition where you get these little comet tails that come down from the wall of the gallbladder. So it can sometimes be diffuse along the whole gallbladder wall, like in these examples, or sometimes it's more focal. So here we have adenomyomatosis just isolated to the fundus in a couple of different slices. So here we have a longitudinal image of the gallbladder here and the arrows point to a solid mass that's coming out of the gallbladder wall here, and it's definitely more than a centimeter. So I hope you would all recognize that this is a red flag, high risk, potentially malignant lesion that needs urgent further imaging and follow up. So depending on you know, the time of day, if it's during normal hours, you could potentially try and get a radiologist or a suitable expert to review this at the time. If not, get it reviewed at the earliest opportunity and arrange whatever further imaging or follow-up is needed yourself. So whether they need 
a contrast ultrasound or a CT or an MRI, uh, whether they need follow-up in a two-week wait clinic, make sure you arrange whatever follow-up is necessary. And as I said, you, know, you could potentially make a big impact to this patient if you pick something like this up early on a point of care ultrasound, you could save their life. Okay, so these look like gallstones, right? The bright, hyperechoic, rounded structures with shadowing, sitting in the most dependent part of the gallbladder. But I can tell you, these are not gallstones. This is actually the duodenum, which is pushing in against the gallbladder wall and giving the appearance of being within the gallbladder lumen. So the duodenum is the structure that's most often mistaken for the gallbladder. With experience, they're relatively easy to tell apart. But let's go through some of the differences of the gallbladder compared to the duodenum. So here is duodenum with the typical gut signature on ultrasound. So if your machine has sufficient resolution, you can actually see five distinct layers of gut mucosa on ultrasound. So a bright outer layer, and then a darker inner layer, and then alternating bright, dark, bright. So this is the typical gut signature that you see with any intestinal mucosa. This is as opposed to the gallbladder wall, which is usually just a single, thin, bright layer. In this image, it looks like it could be the Wes pattern that we mentioned earlier, right, with the wall echo shadow, and it's nestled into the gallbladder fossa here. But if I play the clip, you'll see that there are actually some ring down artifacts, these bright white lines that are known as B lines in lung ultrasound. They're the same thing. Any gas fluid interface will cause this phenomenon. But if you see this, you know this is duodenum. So there's a bit of gas and fluid within the bowel causing this ring down artifact. Okay, so finally, the main event, acute cholecystitis, what you've all been waiting for. And let's start with the definition. So a bunch of experts got together in Tokyo and came up with an official definition. And it relies on three criteria. So A is local inflammation. So Murphy sign or right upper quadrant tenderness. B is systemic inflammation. So fever or a inflammatory marker rise. And C is imaging findings. And if you have A plus B, then that's suspected cholecystitis. And if you also have confirmatory imaging findings, then that's a definite diagnosis. They also defined severity categories in Tokyo. So moderate is when your white cells are more than 18, or you have a palpable tender mass in your right upper quadrant, if your symptoms have been going for more than 72 hours, or if there are any signs of abscess, peritonism, or emphysematous or gangrenous gallbladder. Severe is when there's organ dysfunction. So either shock, reduced GCS, hypoxia, or kidney, liver, or hematological derangements. And mild is when you don't have any of those features. In terms of the ultrasound findings, there are three main findings. The presence of a gallstone, wall thickening, and the sonographic Murphy sign. So in terms of the stone, of course you can have a calculus cholecystitis, but the vast majority of cholecystitis, there will be a gallstone visible. And for it to be causing a problem, as we said, it should be impacted, usually in the neck or in the cystic duct, rather than just rolling around in the body or the fundus where it's probably just an incidental finding that's not actually causing the patient's symptoms. In terms of wall thickening, so three millimeters is the cutoff. So if it's four or five, that would be sort of borderline. And apparently in the US, if the patient has a four or five millimeter thick gallbladder wall, the next question the surgeon will ask is, does the patient have health insurance? Uh, but if the wall, gallbladder wall is sort of six, seven, eight millimeters, that's definitely thickened. So there's something going on but it's not always because of acute cholecystitis. So some edematous states can cause wall thickening. If the patient has you know, heart or liver or kidney failure or ascites, you can get some gallbladder wall thickening due to that. Or if there are other local inflammatory processes like pancreatitis, that could also cause the gallbladder wall to become thickened. So it's not completely specific to cholecystitis. And finally, the sonographic Murphy sign. So this is a really useful test, but it's often performed quite poorly. The idea is you line up the gallbladder in the middle of the screen, and then you push with the probe, and you assess whether that is the point of maximum tenderness. But if your patient's presented with abdominal pain, and you just push them in the tummy with your probe, and ask them, was that sore? They're probably going to say yes, and it's not a very useful test if you just do it like that. What you need to do is push them over the gallbladder, but then also poke them again with the probe a couple of inches away 
and ask them which of those two was more tender. Then it's a discriminatory test and it becomes much more useful. There are a couple of other ultrasound findings of acute cholecystitis, pericholecystic fluid and a gallbladder width of more than four centimeters. But I've put these in smaller font because they're less useful. Pericholecystic fluid definitely can be a sign of cholecystitis, but it can occur in other conditions, other associated inflammatory conditions like pancreatitis, for example, and also the gallbladder width of more than four centimeters. Definitely it is a sign of cholecystitis, but again, not very specific. So I've put these two as minor signs of cholecystitis. So here is a beautiful example of acute cholecystitis. So we have a big fat gallstone impacted in the neck, casting a shadow, a bit of sludge sitting on the top of the gallstone, and we have a really thick, juicy, inflamed wall. You can even see a little strip of hypoechoic or darkness within the gallbladder wall there. So that's a sonolucent layer suggesting mucosal edema. They've measured the anterior gallbladder wall here as 8.7 millimeters, so definitely thickened. And we should always measure anteriorly rather than posteriorly. And the reason for this is because of an artifact called post-cystic enhancement. And to understand post-cystic enhancement, you need to also understand a little bit of ultrasound physics and the concept of attenuation. So when the ultrasound beam comes down from the probe, as it goes down, some of that beam is attenuated, which means it's either reflected away or absorbed and it gets gradually weaker as it goes down. But di different tissues attenuate the beam to different degrees. So for example, this big stone, all of the ultrasound is reflected away and so there's a shadow behind. It's been completely attenuated. However, when the ultrasound goes through a cystic structure like the gallbladder or the urinary bladder, very little of that beam is attenuated. Most of the power of the beam remains in it. That's why behind the gallbladder, it's much brighter because there's a lot more of that ultrasound beam strength still there. And this means it's difficult to actually see where the posterior border of the gallbladder wall ends because you've got this bright post-cystic enhancement beyond the gallbladder anyway. And so I'm sure you can agree, it's really difficult to see where that posterior wall ends and it's much more accurate to measure the gallbladder wall anteriorly. And a lot of ultrasound is about pattern recognition. So I'll just show you a few more examples of acute cholecystitis now. So here's another beautiful picture with a gallstone in the neck and a grossly thickened wall and a little rim of pericholecystic fluid here. So this is in long axis. And then this example is in short axis. Another very unhappy looking gallbladder here with a very thickened wall and some edema within the wall, the dark areas within the wall. A mucosal edema. Another sick gallbladder. Here you can just see a little strip of pericholecystic fluid just behind the gallbladder there. Another sad gallbladder here with a couple of stones with shadowing and then a very thickened wall here anteriorly with a strip of either pericholecystic fluid or mucosal edema. Either way a very unhappy gallbladder. And here's a slightly more subtle example. So the wall isn't as thickened here, but there is an area here anteriorly where we can see there is significant thickening of the wall. So it could be an early cholecystitis. And here's a more severe example. So here we have sludge within the gallbladder lumen and a grossly thickened wall. This was actually a perforated gallbladder. So the, the really severe end of the spectrum here. And this example shows a stone in the neck this is the gallbladder in long axis, and there's actually a flap here. It looks a bit like a retinal detachment on ocular ultrasound. And this is actually gangrenous cholecystitis, and some of the mucosa has sloughed off and is flapping around within the gallbladder lumen. Now this example looks like cholecystitis. We've got a couple of stones here with shadowing. This is the gallbladder here in long axis. We've got a thickened wall. They've measured it there anteriorly to be seven millimeters. So if you pressed with the probe and had a positive sonographic Murphy's, then that would be the three ultrasound features of cholecystitis, right? You'd have gallstones, wall thickening, and sonographic Murphy sign. But I can tell you this was not acute cholecystitis. These white arrows here are pointing to something here, just anterior or superficial to the liver. And if we look on the um, equivalent CT image, 
we can see that was actually a little bit of free gas casting a shadow down over the gallbladder. And this was a case of a perforated ulcer. So this is just to make the point that even when you see classic signs of cholecystitis on ultrasound, it could still be something else. It's not a 100% sensitive or specific test. So we still need to keep in mind differentials, keep thinking broadly, and factor in the ultrasound findings with our clinical picture. Okay, so hopefully you have a good idea now what cholecystitis looks like on ultrasound. So next, let's review some evidence. And first, let's start with can ED doctors perform this scan as well as radiologists? And there has been actually a prospective study on this topic. So Summers et al. looked at about 200 patients and they compared ED scans to radiology scans against a reference standard of final diagnosis or pathology specimen. And as you can see, the diagnostic accuracy of ED compared to radiology was pretty much the same. So in the 80s for sensitivity and specificity for both groups. The European surgeons got together recently and came up with a consensus statement for surgeon-performed point-of-care ultrasound. But actually a lot of the evidence was emergency physician-performed point-of-care ultrasound. So I think it would have actually been better named non-radiologist-performed point-of-care ultrasound. And they asked several questions and used a Delphi process to come up with expert uh, agreed conclusions to those questions. So the first question was, what should be the first line imaging for acute cholecystitis? And so they reviewed all the evidence for the diagnostic accuracy of the four main imaging modalities for acute cholecystitis, ultrasound, CT, MR, and scintigraphy. So scintigraphy had the highest diagnostic accuracy, but then they also factored in other considerations like availability of the test and radiation, etc. And putting everything together, they decided that the first line imaging for acute cholecystitis should be ultrasound. So next, the surgeons asked, are non-radiologists comparable to radiologists? Obviously, if they've had training in diagnosing acute cholecystitis by ultrasound. And the answer to this question was yes. Then they asked, can ultrasound predict difficult surgery? And the answer to this was also yes. Essentially, the more severe the picture on ultrasound, the more likely the patient is to go on to need an open cholecystectomy, for example. And then they asked, what are the most useful ultrasound signs? And they found them to be those three main signs that we talked about before. Gallstones, wall thickening, and the sonographic Murphy sign. So Gaspari, you may recognize this name from his work on ultrasound in cardiac arrest. But here he looked at the learning curve for point of care ultrasound of the gallbladder. So this was a US study. He looked at 350 patients and just over 40 emergency medicine doctors and asked the question, how many scans are needed for competency? So how many scans does an emergency medicine doctor need to do until their conclusions correlate well with a radiologist's conclusions? And the magic number was 25. So in general, point of care ultrasound should be used for binary questions. But does the patient have a AAA or not? Does the patient have acute cholecystitis or not? However, patients don't always present with such Sort of binary presentations often will have quite a broad differential. And so I like to think of point of care ultrasound more in terms of bundles. So if you consider a 60 year old man who presents with right flank pain, we're not just going to look at their gallbladder, we're also going to look at their aorta and possibly also their kidney for hydronephrosis. Whereas if it was a 30 year old female, we wouldn't be so interested in their aorta, but we might look for free fluid to see if they've maybe got a ruptured ectopic. And if it was an 80 year old with confusion and fever, there'd be a much broader differential. So here we might look at the lungs for pneumonia. We might look at the bladder, the urinary bladder for retention. So I think the, the point of care ultrasound exam should follow the clues in the clinical history and examination. So just how your physical examination follows the clues in your history. So your point of care ultrasound should almost be like an extension of the examination following the clues in the preceding clinical exam. Okay, let's talk about the common bile duct, or the CBD. So the only fact you need to remember about the anatomy of the CBD is that it lies anterior to the portal vein. If you just remember this one single fact, then if it's dilated, you'll be able to identify it. 
In terms of its normal size, so internal diameter, we always measure in, inner to inner wall for the CVD, and the internal diameter should be six millimeters or less. It can be a little bit more than this in the elderly or in post cholecystectomy patients. So as a rule of thumb, one millimeter per decade is allowable. So if it's a 90 year old, they're allowed up to nine millimeters. Or if the patient's had a cholecystectomy, then it's allowed to be up to about 10 or 12 millimeters. So here's a beautiful picture of the porta hepatis. So first to find the porta hepatis, get the gallbladder in long axis and it will point you down to the porta. And at the bottom here, we have the portal vein, which will be the deepest or most posterior structure. And then lying anterior to it, we have the hepatic artery and the CVD. Now, if you see two structures that are both thin, lying anterior to the portal vein, then does it matter which one is the CVD? Because whichever one it is, you know it's not dilated. If the CVD is dilated, then it will be easy to dis distinguish from the hepatic artery because it'll be much thicker. So in this example, the CVD is almost as thick as the portal vein. And my professor from Teesside University, Bob Jarman, he loves to relate everything to food. So for example, for the parasternal short axis on echo, he likes to call that the pastry view because the LV should be round like a donut and the RV should be curved around it like a croissant. And he calls the porta hepatis the P sandwich view because the CBD and the portal vein are like two slices of bread and the hepatic artery is like a little P in the middle. And here I've taken the liberty of creating Bob's P sandwich for your viewing pleasure. Unfortunately, since Brexit, this is all we can eat in the UK now. We can't get any French cheese or anything anymore. So for our international viewers, this is our diet now in the UK. So here's a beautiful example of the CBD in long axis. So it's coming from the porta here all the way down across to the head of the pancreas. So it definitely looks dilated if it was a young person. So we can see it's about a centimeter in width if you look at the marks here on the side. So if this was a hundred year old or a post cholecystectomy patient, it may well be normal. I can't see any actual stone within it. But if this was a young patient, then this would definitely be dilated. Here's another example of a CBD. So we have the port portal vein posteriorly, and then just anterior to it, just this little slit here. You can just see they've put calipers from inner to inner wall. Looks like it's only about a millimeter or two thick. So lying parallel and anterior to the portal vein is the CBD. In young people, it can be so thin, it can be really hard to see. But if you can see that there is a couple of thin structures just anterior to the portal vein, and they're both normal in diameter, then it doesn't really matter which one is the hepatic artery and which one is the CBD, because you know they're both normal. So going back to Bob's analogy, here the upper slice of bread, the CVD, is narrow or thin, so a similar width to the P or the hepatic artery, whereas the portal vein will always be a big fat slice of bread at the bottom. And here's another example of the CVD. So we've got the gallbladder here in long axis, which is pointing down to the portal vein. So that's a good way to find the portal vein. And then simply rotate your probe to bring out the portal vein in long axis and look for the CVD just anterior to it. And here the measurement is 3.9 millimeters, which is normal. Color Doppler can be useful to distinguish the CBD from a blood vessel. So blood flows quickly, so we, we get a Doppler signal from it, whereas bile flows slowly, so there's no Doppler signal. So here's the portal vein at the bottom with Doppler signal within it, and this structure here has no Doppler signal, so this must be a bile duct. So this is the CBD. And you can see it's actually bigger than the portal vein here, so it's definitely dilated. They've taken a measurement of 12 millimeters here. So anterior parallel to the portal vein. If it's as big or bigger than the portal vein, it may well be dilated, depending on the patient's age and whether they've had a cholecystectomy. Whereas if it's narrow and thin, much smaller than the portal vein, then it's probably normal. And here's a brilliant image of stones both in the gallbladder and in the CBD. So this slide is taken from the ultrasound GEL website. So GEL stands for Gathering Evidence from the Literature. So it's a fantastic website that does critical appraisal on point of care ultrasound topics. And they looked at this paper by Laham et al from 2017. And they asked the question, is the CBD actually a useful thing to measure in terms of emergency medicine point of care ultrasound? So it was a prospective study of about 150 patients. And they asked the question, does the measurement of the CBD 
actually change our management? Would it have identified complicated biliary pathology, which otherwise wouldn't have been picked up either by bloods or by a gallbladder ultrasound? And they found the answer to that question to be no, it's not useful, because in zero of the patients would CBD have actually added anything. All of the patients who had complicated biliary pathology would have been identified either by bloods or by gallbladder ultrasound findings. And this fits with my experience in clinical practice. You know, I don't find the CBD that useful. I find the gallbladder to be a much more useful thing to scan from an emergency department perspective. I think on courses, we often focus a lot on the CBD because gallbladder is quite easy to find and people get a bit bored of scanning the gallbladder and they want to challenge themselves by looking for the CBD. You know, it's a bit cooler, a bit more interesting. But actually in clinical practice, it's not that useful and the gallbladder is much more useful. Okay, so some take home points. Number one, in terms of technique, patient positioning is crucial. So lie the patient on their left side, ask them to take a deep breath in and hold their breath. And then when you're fanning through the gallbladder, really focus in on the neck of the gallbladder because this is where, if there is a gallstone, this is where it's gonna be causing a problem. Number two, there is evidence to suggest that non-radiologists can diagnose acute cholecystitis accurately but they do need to perform about 25 scans to develop this level of competence. Three, don't stress too much about the CBD. If you can see a couple of tiny structures anterior to the portal vein, then you can be pretty sure the CBD is normal. But if you can't find it, don't stress too much. A good assessment of the gallbladder is probably much more useful from an emergency medicine perspective. And finally, scan intelligently using POCUS bundles. Pick up the clues in the history and the exam to build up a differential diagnosis and then use POCUS for binary questions for each of those differential diagnoses. Okay, so now what? Hopefully I've convinced you that there is a potential role for gallbladder point of care ultrasound in the emergency department. How useful it is perhaps depends somewhat on where you work and your access to formal radiology services. But I think in most places in the UK, it's very difficult to get an ultrasound out of hours. And I think for the two patient groups that we talked about with those cases at the start, so the, the patient with sort of undifferentiated upper abdominal pain, or for the perhaps elderly patient with a fever of unknown source, I think in these two groups, the finding of acute cholecystitis can really change the patient's management. So how do you achieve competency and accreditation? Well, in the UK at the moment, uh, there's a few options. I went down the university route, so I did a postgrad certificate at Teesside University. Uh, within emergency medicine, there was a level two system that included gallbladder scanning. That's been lying dormant for a few years now, but we're hoping to reinvigorate that process. So there may be something through the college shortly. Uh, another option is just to go through your local department and trust. So if you have enough expertise within your department and you have a good relationship with radiology and your sonographers, you could train within your own department, especially if you're based somewhere long term. And if your department and your trust agrees to that, you could have some kind of sign off process with a logbook and a triggered assessment within your own department. So there are a few different options. Uh, yeah, feel free to contact me if you have any questions about this on the email address below. Thanks very much for listening and I wish you all the best. Oh, here are the references to the articles mentioned in the talk. And here are some links if you would like to learn more on this topic. So thanks very much for listening. Apologies for my hair, by the way. All the hairdressers have been closed for ages. Uh, but yeah, please feel free to get in touch and send me an email if you have any follow-up questions at the address below.